is this working? And can you hear me? <laughs> That's the... Do I have... Uh... Do I have an... How's... How's my audio? Let me know if you're in the comments or anything else. I'm gonna talk about what businesses are doing well right now. Just a few of the, the trends I've seen. And uh, yeah, if you wanna jump in and talk about anything, let me know in the comments. Chris can hear me, Adrian can hear me. Is it Yabar can hear me? Nice to see you folks. I'm um, on YouTube as well. YouTube.com slash Justin Jackson slash live if you want to go over there. Oh, apparently I'm on Facebook as well. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, what's doing well right now, what's not doing well. And I'm going to show you some, just some of the trends I've seen so far. Um, I'm using Restream and uh, Ecamm Live. Yeah, uh, Kelly, I see you there in the comments. Um, and I've actually thought about you quite a bit over these past weeks because clearly a lot of businesses are not doing well. Um, hey, Jason, how's it going, man? Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Got a lot of Facebook people. Where's my YouTube folks at? Uh, yeah, what's going on here? Um, so let's talk about maybe both let's talk about you know what is going well and what's not going well and we'll start with maybe what's not going well hey sam podlegar oh this is a good question on um on twitch is my audio synced up with camera and microphone i was trying to fix that so holy tony ebden what is going on here? All it takes is some self-isolation to bring us all together here in my basement. <laughs> uh, um, so you're saying that things are synced up okay? I, I fixed that problem? Beauty, audio is grand. Well, I'm in my house, so who knows who might walk behind here? Um, much better but still not quite synced okay well we'll keep working on it it's synced everywhere else I don't know why twitch in particular doesn't have it working okay so I want to start by just uh, showing you this study that came out of um, Cloudflare Cloudflare does all sorts of um, I mean they they do they they host well how can I say this they can I get this right here they um, Cloudflare does like they're basically a service that goes on top of websites to make them faster they cache all of the content and make it faster and they're analyzing 26 million web properties over the world they handle about 10 percent of the Fortune 1000 companies and so they can see what traffic's are go what where traffic is going up and where it's going down. And right now, traffic is down in financial planning, traffic is down in low cost travel and probably uh, travel all the way, football, I'm guessing all sports, home repair and DIY down 23%, buying and selling homes, makes sense uh, because people are uncertain right now. And dining out is down 18%. And this was, you know, I, I'm guessing these numbers are going to continue to get uh, ex exacerbated. <laughs> Is that the right word? Uh, because um, 
we're still in the beginning of this, right? Uh, this article was published March 25th, so yesterday. And, uh, you know, Dan Price has a, a payment processing company primarily for small business, small shops and restaurants. And here is what they're seeing across the board. Uh, by the way, are you, is that... Is that big enough for you folks? Can you see that at home? Do I need to uh, pump that up a bit? All right, let's see. So current, I can probably zoom in a little bit. Um, some basic math on how dire this is for small business. We process payments for small biz. Across the board, their revenue is down 50%. How long the average small biz can last like that before going bankrupt? 32 days for restaurants. Retail, it's 38 days. All small biz, 54 days. And then how long small businesses in the 25th percentile can last based on the current 50% revenue, revenue loss? Restaurants is 18 days. Retail is 20 days. All small biz, 26 days. Basically, it's shut down immediately or have a couple excruciating weeks before death. And then he goes on to say, small businesses go belly up fast because it's often not possible to build up savings. The median small biz makes an operating profit of $7 a day. A lot of them go into debt and wait to make real profits years down the line if they can get there. So a month, way off target. So a month of, you know, not earning revenue basically means death for those businesses. And this is what's been heartbreaking for me and I know for a lot of you to see your favorite restaurants struggling. Folks like Kelly, folks like uh, my friend Andrew and lots of other small businesses. I mean, uh, some small businesses, some small restaurants have been able to stay open for takeout, but I'm, I'm thinking about the uh, the aesthetics place in uh, my office building in the basement, there's an aesthetics place, Mela's Aesthetics. Well, you can't do nails and hair and everything else right now. And so they have no money coming in to pay for groceries, to pay their mortgage, to pay commercial rent. And even though help is coming, it's still... If you've never been in a cash crunch, you don't know how painful it is to be in the in-between time, to have all of your revenue just that gets turned off, and yet all everything else is still running, even though there's the promise that the government might help with mortgages and rents and all those things. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky time. Uh, and I certainly am identify with what Dan is saying here. Um, small business, is this? small businesses, record layoffs and closures lost half of their revenues already. Jeff Bezos has gotten $4 billion richer this year, despite the stock market crash because Amazon is doing so well. Big business already dominated America. I fear when this is over, they will be all that's left. And um, that, that really is, that's the, that's the worry in all of this, is on one hand, we can see big businesses like Amazon, some of them are doing well. But we're also seeing the unemployment numbers now start to come in. And we don't have exact numbers. We don't exactly know how it's going to shake out. We also don't have bankruptcy numbers. We don't have... Uh, there's also not numbers for how many people are just already struggling with the debt that they have. And so all of these things are going to have to be reckoned with, right? Like all of these things are going to, to come down on us. Uh, eventually, people's credit is going to run out. Eventually, those credit card bills, bills are going to come due. And... what are we going to do about it, right? How are we going to rebuild after this is done? Are we just going to keep putting money in Jeff Bezos's pocket or are we going to try to create a community, 
a network of small businesses that um, can actually make it work. How can we make it work? How can we make it so that shopping for a small at a small business is more convenient, more enjoyable, has faster shipping and better selection than Amazon? And yeah, so much bad news. Um, sorry, and I, folks are sharing links. I can't directly access links in here, so I missed this one, Ross. Um, but yeah, and then we have um, we have you know folks like Yang. But I think we all feel this. You know, they're suffering the most right now right there with the people they used to employ. And this was the, the point I was just trying to make, actually, is that I think if the unemployment numbers have shown us anything, it's that Amazon is not the bedrock of the economy. That small restaurant, that small cafe, that small shop downtown, that small business that did you know, warehousing or whatever, those are the bedrock of the economy. And if, when you take those away, um, your community loses those jobs maybe forever. And I'm not just talking about uh, I'm not just talking about local businesses. I'm also talking about internet businesses. So, um, and actually, maybe I'll show you this too. Oh wait, what's this here? More than seventy percent of small business owners who took part of the survey said this, they'll be forced to close within three months. Yeah. And it makes sense. You know, I've been there. I used to own uh, a snowboard shop in Alberta and margins are low. You basically have every complexity, logistical complexity you can imagine with a small business. You have to deal with commercial rent. You have to deal with the homeless population. You have to deal with just people coming into your store and stealing things, theft. You have to deal with security. You have to deal with GST and remitting sales tax. You have to deal with inventory. You have to deal with ordering inventory. You have to deal with scheduling employees. You have to deal, like the, the list goes on. These businesses are incredibly difficult to run, but, um, they have all of these risks as well. So this is a conversation. I anonymized it, but <laughs> the person, there's someone watching live that I had this interaction with. Um, this was a conversation I had because I was complaining that, you know, Square, the point of sale system, they, they, they I've been trying to use their online ordering system to order from local restaurants and cafes. And I'm like, man, this checkout is brutal. And some of you have heard me ranting about it. It has like 17 different fields. And, but he responded saying, you know, they're overwhelmed right now because vendors are just now waking up to the idea that we need to set this up now. And, in many ways, it's too late. Like uh, I saw some other, um, another stat, I'll have to find the, the source, but the, the source basically said, um, if the, the folks that are doing, oh, you know what, it was a Grubhub, I'll find it. Uh, Grubhub was saying that folks who had already set up online stores and uh, local delivery were being able to, you know, we're weathering this a lot uh, better than folks that, who had to set it up instantly, which makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, this is the article. And yeah, I think, um, I can't remember what the exact quote is, but you know, they're receiving 10 to 15 times their usual restaurant leads. Um, and but the demand from consumers is a mixed bag, right? It's just everyone's had to change so quickly. Okay, so let's talk about uh, what businesses are doing well right now. Let's move this over here. 
so let's go back to this um, this study and let's see what what searches are up. So let's highlight this with yellow. So tutoring is up right now. Makes sense. All these parents are trying to figure out what to what they're going to do with their kids. Uh, let's pump this up. Um, so tutoring is up. Politics. Television programs up 210%, gardening up 200%, children's ed education, looks like religion, religious topics are up, uh, information and discussion about board games, uh, books, desserts and baking, national news is up, that's definitely true. And I think, I mean, this list is by no means exhaustive, but what's instructive about it is we as business owners and creators and makers need to be thinking in this new world, not just now, but also in the future, what are people going to be searching for now? And I can tell you one company whose business is way up is Gumroad. Gumroad is a... Uh, platform that allows people to sell products online and they're seeing a huge rise in interest because suddenly people are realizing, oh, I need to sell my book online now or I need another source of income. And I know speaking to my other friends that are in similar businesses, anyone right now who is offering people another way to make an income, you know, maybe a way to make some money on the side, maybe a way to, uh, you know, just anything. People are desperate for anything. Um, those folks are seeing a big rise in interest. And I want to be sensitive right now to say, um, in one ha on one hand, this is the new world. I think... Folks who, you know, maybe didn't have multiple sources of income in the past, in the future, they're going to want multiple sources of income. And so platforms like Gumroad, like Podia, like Memberful, like Memberspace, they, I think, are going to see a lot more interest. Um, also, platforms like... I think it's these folks here. Yeah. You know, fast where they're selling a one click checkout for uh, retailers to make the checkout experience faster um, as opposed to some of the other checkout experiences I've been trying lately. Um, you know, I think folks like this are going to do well because people will be searching for answers to these kinds of problems. How do I get my store online? How do I make the checkout experience better? How can I uh, reach my customers better? Uh, so I, also, I think um, MailChimp and uh, other email providers are going to be way up, mostly because <laughs> what did we all discover as soon as this hit? You know, for small businesses, your only channel for communicating with customers might have been... Instagram, and it's not reliable, right? Maybe you don't have 10,000 followers, so you can't link out to something. Uh, there's, there's no way for you to directly reach your customers. And so I think MailChimp and platforms like MailChimp are going to be doing really well. In fact, where did I find that? Noah Kagan says that the revenue at SendFox has grown the past few weeks. Oh, I need to... Uh, I need to zoom out here oh. just so you can see the actual screen. Um, yeah, so at, at uh, SendFox, which is an email service provider, uh, they're seeing revenue grow. And part of that, I think, is small business owners saying we've got to have a direct way of reaching our customers that isn't Facebook, that isn't social media. 
Um, and in the future, actually, what I think we'll see, and this is a opportunity for small retailers and shops, is the challenge with owning a small little restaurant or cafe or shop is that it's you, you're, you're isolated, right? You're, you, there, you are doing everything yourself. You're in charge of, you know, all your staffing and ordering and all that stuff. But on top of that, you need to be a full-time social media manager and a full-time communicator and a full-time website manager, a full-time e-commerce manager, a full-time email newsletter sender. And I think in the future, the opportunity will be for networks of small retail shops and cafes and restaurants to say, listen, instead of us all doing this separately, why don't we join forces and we'll have the daily lunch digest that we, where we build a central email list and every day we all add our special and every day that gets sent out to a bigger list. And so anybody in Vernon, British Columbia or Halifax or New York City or whatever who signs up for this list will get lunch specials from five or ten different places and maybe combined we can be stronger than when we're apart and I think it's this kind of thinking that we're going to need to fight the big behemoths like Amazon together there may be opportunities to create network effects and you know uh, be stronger than if you were doing everything separate in a silo Uh, sorry, people are sending me some links here. Any other com any comments on what I just said? I, I need to t <laughs> take a little breather. This is just kind of all still at the top of my head. I'm not, I haven't really synthesized this. I'm trying to get it out. And uh, as I get it out, it becomes more clear. Uh, no, David, this is live. This is not uh, some sort of pre-order video. <laughs> yeah, so this is an article that Ross shared. The COVID-19 crisis is transforming the way we use software. Remote software is eating the world. And uh, yeah, certainly uh, Zoom is doing pretty good. Where was that link I had? Here's Zoom's increase in usage. And uh, I mean, the other thing is we can see some of this just by observing, right? All of us are watching our friends and our employers and our clients we're watching that we, we we don't need to see this chart to know that zoom zoom usage is increasing we we know this uh intuitively because we can see it happening more and more people are going to zoom many for the first time and so yeah remote tools are going to do really well right now audio conferencing video conferencing, webinar, collaborative whiteboarding, virtual classroom, remote desktop, um, online learning platforms. Yeah, these are all going to do really, really well. And uh, it's something to think about. How, if you're in the place to pivot your business or you're in the place to build software, this might be the kind of software you want to get into. It's not a surefire bet. Zoom's got a big head start, right? This is, this is part about swimming in the water and looking for the waves as they come. If you're already in the water looking for waves, it's a lot easier to spot them or be in the right place at the right time. Some folks are saying that VR might be big. I know Noah Kagan was uh, bullish on this. I'm not as bullish on it. Mostly because I haven't seen any evidence of it yet. Lots of evidence of people using Zoom calls at their office or to keep in touch with family. You know, I'm seeing lots of screenshots of people doing FaceTime calls and Zoom calls. 
I haven't seen a lot of people running out and buying VR yet. And I like to see some evidence of the market pull that people are actually going out and doing these things on mass. And so I, I, I'm not as bullish on VR. I could be wrong. Um, baby Layton says, hi. Oh, this is Ashley. I used to work with Ashley. He's wondering what careers he should get to in a, get into in about 18 years. It's a good question. The, you know, I'm actually going to be a little bit, um, I'll say something counterintuitive, which is, I think a lot of folks are going to, based on this experience, are going to say, I am never starting a local business. I'm never going to start a coffee shop or a small little uh, retail store or a restaurant. And I think we need to be careful about that because my sense is that people's desire to be in common spaces and to be relating with each other in public, I don't think that's going to go away. I think what does need to change is the business model that a lot of those places have. Uh, you know, margins are going to need to be improved. There's going to be need to be a shift in how they do business. But they're not necessarily bad small businesses to start. I think they'll be still difficult businesses to run, but I think there will still be opportunities in small businesses and maybe even more than there would be normally. Software is probably going to be a thing for a long time. Technology companies are going to be a thing for a long time. Um, and a lot of this will depend, you know, 18 years, thinking 18 years in the future. My, my daughter is going to university right now, and I'm trying to think, like, what's can the world like going to be for her in two years, much less 18? But a lot of what the future looks like in 18 years is going to depend on the decisions that we make as a society now. Are we going to bail out airlines with no strings attached? Or are we going to say, you know what, maybe instead we should be investing in small businesses. And if we do offer bailouts, then maybe those need to have a lot of strings attached. Um, I do think lots of businesses will continue to be you know, there'll be lots of opportunities on the internet, Lewis. I'm just saying, don't ignore local. I think local still has a future. Here's my buddy, Steven. Uh, what happens to the 30 to 50 year old demographic in the work field once these automated systems eliminate jobs? I mean, this will be an issue. Although, to tell you the truth, I think... Um, we don't really know what's going to happen, but Stephen, here's one scenario is it's not the 30 to 50 year olds that have to worry. It's the 50 to 70 year olds that are still working and still commanding these really high salaries. What if after all this is done and all the dust, dust settles, a lot of these businesses are like, let's get rid of those people. They're costing us too much. Let's get these hungry whippersnappers. And so again, none of us know, but there's a possible future where uh, there's actually a lot more opportunities for people, let's say, from 20 to 50. Um, and it's going to be the 50 to 70-year-olds who are still working and uh, have built up a high salary over the years on the salary, the salary grid uh, that might be at the most risk. But it's hard to tell. Uh, automation is definitely a concern, although I used to be way more concerned about it and I've kind of uh, backpedaled a bit. Partly because I think our, there's actually not a lot of good data on how many people are losing jobs or having their jobs downgraded by automation. And I know like intuitively it seems like, oh, that must be happening. Like people must be losing jobs from robots and artificial intelligence all the time but there's still not a lot of evidence of that. And, you know, I used to be the person that was sounding the alarm and showing that map of the United States that shows that like truck drivers is the biggest employer for middle-class people, like being a truck driver. And, 
you know, as soon as these self-driving semi-trucks come out, all of that's going to be eliminated. But we still haven't seen that happen. And in truth, it might be 10 to 20 years before that really happens. Um, and so I'm not saying I'm not worried about it completely, but I'm way more worried about Amazon than I am uh, automation and artificial intel intelligence right now. So, um, b by the way, I, I just, I don't know if I would build products for the VR market. Who do you know, like a normal person or a normal family that is buying VR gear and VR software right now or in games? It's not like, look at your friends. What are they actually buying? They're buying iPads for the kids. They're buying Nintendo Switch. They're buying, you know, uh, since... We could say that we could do this in the in the comments here. What has your family bought since the since we all went into isolation? Uh, we bought a game for the Switch called Cuphead. We've bought lots of mobile games uh, for iOS. Um, we have bought some things from Amazon. <laughs> I hate it, but we have. I, you know. Uh, we've bought as much as we can from local restaurants. We bought a ton of things from grocery stores. Uh, so we need to pay attention to what are people actually buying. Where are people actually in motion? Not exactly where do you think they might be in motion. This is where that Wayne Gretzky uh, quote actually breaks down, where he says, "Skate to where you think the puck's going to be, not where you know whatever that is." And uh, I. With commerce and business, I think it's way wiser to observe what's happening at the grassroots and where people are actually in motion now. Where are they actually spending money now? What points of their day are they taking out their wallets and actually paying for something? And, you know, what are those categories? So, yeah, Rob totally on the money people still looking for experiences which cannot always be found online so local businesses are still important folks i want to go to a restaurant so bad <laughs> i'm tired of being here i want to go out with friends i want to have a drink i want to meet up with people at the coffee shop i want to go for a date with my wife like i local I, at least for me i miss local right now Um, okay, so Zoom's doing well. Uh, where else was I going to... I was going to show you something else in terms of other businesses that are doing well. Uh, this was another just observation. What other businesses are doing well right now? Maybe I can just focus on this. Um, Amazon, Tela Anything, Auto Insurers, Medical Practices, Netflix Cable. Although Auto Insurers is a weird one. I don't know why that's there. So, uh, the G2 link, that's a good, I'll see if I can post it on here. Um, oh, sorry. Let me try it again. That's the G2, G2 link. It's pretty long, though. Uh, you probably can't read that, though. Let me change it to, I'll change the text. Um, sorry, bear with me. There we go. Uh, sure, the title is the COVID-19 crisis is transforming the way we use software. Uh, are there any other businesses that you folks have seen doing well right now? Um, oh, no, I just messed up my, messed up all my text here. Uh, 
Well, this is this is why you can't have nice things. Um, Lewis, I wouldn't be starting any business until I can see that there's a market pull. What are people pulling for? And right now, uh, consulting, you know, everyone's checking their budgets right now. I think there's not a lot of pull there right now, although consulting will come back. So if you want to swim out to a good surf spot, what you think will be a good surf spot in the future, metaphorically, and you just want to hang out in the water because you think, oh, consulting's going to come back. So when that wave comes, I'm going to be ready to swim out. Then that might be a good plan. But um, I personally like to see where is there already pull? Where is interest increasing? Where are people in motion now? Where are they spending their money now? Yeah, fitness at home, medical equipment production, for sure. Uh, oh, there's this tweet that I can't get to. Let's see if I can. Let's see if I can get there on. If I if I join my own. If I join my my own live stream. Then I can get that link. So just bear with me. Uh, well. Except I can't see it. Uh, let's just go to Udarian. I don't know who it is. Udarian. So I think this is the right tweet. Just ran a poll inside of our community on how COVID-19 has impacted revenue for seven to eight figure store owners. There's a lot of pain out there, especially for a subset of merchants, but median decline in revenue was 10%. I would have guessed it was closer to 30 to 40% for most non-Amazon store. Yeah, there's a ton of variability one in four businesses has seen rest revenue drop over 50%. Um, one in eight merchants have seen revenue explode by 50% or more. Lots of extreme winners and losers. I mean, this, this kind of, <laughs> this kind of uh, highlights how things are right now. Of course. Yeah. Toilet paper. You make, do it like, where do we get our toilet paper? Do we, we're not making that in Canada, are we? Or are we? Uh, let's see if I had anything else here. So I talked a little bit about businesses that I think are doing well and will do well in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm certainly... I can tell you for Transistor one thing I'm thinking because we do podcast hosting and analytics. And um, I would say growth has slowed down, um, but we're still growing. I think the economic impacts of this are going to hit us later. Need some water. I think the economic impacts of this are going to hit us maybe, I don't know, one, two, three months from now when people are, are and businesses especially, are evalu evaluating their spending and going, okay, well, how important is this channel for us? And I'm contrived. Contrived? I'm, I mean, looking at the businesses that are doing well, so let me kind of unravel my thinking here. Uh, we have a private podcasting feature that allows you to um, create a podcast that is subscription only. Um, and I can show it to you, I guess. And so something I've thought about is, you know, maybe we should be making 
these private podcasts. Uh, so basically what you do is you can send an invite link to, in this case, I have a paid community called Mega Maker Club and you can send an invite link and they can get this private podcast. So this, in this case, this private podcast is only for paid members of this community that I run. And um, I've thought about, you know, what are some ways we can make this more, um, you know, we can p enable other people to do the same thing, to have people pay to access private podcast content. And I think that still could be a viable thing to do. Um, we could also integrate with our partners like member space and, and other play people that are already doing the, the billing side, and then they can just connect to transistors, private podcasting thing. Uh, so I think that will, you know, that that's one hedge that we're using as a podcast hosting company. Um, we've also seen a lot of interest from companies that are now remote and are looking for ways to communicate with all of their employees <laughs> worldwide. And some of them are thinking, well, why don't we use a private podcast? So I think that's how I'm starting to think about it. I think, um, you know, the hobbyist podcaster that's just looking to start a show and get it on Amazon, uh, Amazon on Apple podcasts and Spotify uh, we might see some softening of demand there, uh, but maybe not. Maybe a lot of folks will be in their house and <laughs> are looking for something to do and will record their first podcast. So, yeah, I think there's still a lot of this remains to be seen. Uh, all right, I'm getting a lot of great comments here. So, um. Do you think we'll wake up in a bit and stop giving money to the sports and movie stars and value our frontline employees more? Uh, actually, I think sports, I think celebrities will do really well. I think um, services like Cameo, Cameo, um, I think companies like this are going to do really well because we, people, human beings like things that are familiar. And so... You know, there's lots of artists that are live streaming their concerts for free right now. But the one that I noticed was, uh, who's that country singer? Um, oh, look, there me. there's me live. Um, who's a country singer? Um, what's his name? He's he, uh, married to Nicole Kidman. Country singer married to Nicole Kidman. Uh, Keith Urban. So Keith Urban did a live concert on Facebook and, um, you know, people pay attention because they recognize Keith Urban, but for the regular indie artist that doesn't have name recognition, I think they're going to actually maybe find it more difficult. I think celebrities are going to do well, uh, in the downturn and, afterwards as well. Maybe they'll lose revenue from traditional sources like big concerts and, you know, theatrical releases. But honestly, I think people are going to still want music and movies and TV shows, in fact, even more. And I think uh, people will want celebrities because they're familiar. Uh, Ryan Kelly had a great comment here for our business YouTube channel Ryan's got a great YouTube channel I'll bring it up I think it's called the Loam Ranger uh, yeah Loam Ranger if you're into mountain biking uh, Ryan is saying for our business YouTube channel views are up 87% over last month but the cost of advertising is very low right now so our overall income has gone down slightly versus last month uh, yeah and actually um, I hate to be the bringer of bad news, but I think ad rates are going to continue to go down. And so I think if your business depends on advertising, um, I would, yeah, this is there. They, they can only go down further. Um, because <laughs> partly the problem with advertising is that 
advertising depends on attention. And if everybody's attention is focused on a crisis, on the COVID-19 crisis, there's nothing you can really do to pull their attention away from that. If I'm if I'm scrolling Instagram and all I want, I'm only there to get COVID-19, you know, how are people doing with COVID-19 or to escape COVID-19, I it's going to be difficult to say, you know, now you should buy some socks. I'm just not in the mood to buy socks right now. Um, and so, uh, of course, someone in the comments is going to say they just bought socks. But the, the point is that you can't just arrest somebody's attention. You can't force them to say, focus on this ad, even when all they're thinking about, they've just got crisis on the brain. And so, you know, a lot of companies and ad buyers are probably wisely reducing their ad spend. And I think we're going to see more of that. So if I was Ryan Kelly, I would continue to diversify in this moment. I would be um, maybe selling... Uh, you know, the home repair kit on Gumroad or something for bikes, right? Uh, I know, Ryan, you've experimented with online courses in the past. Um, it might be time to dust some of that off and try again. Yeah, so Dropkick Murphys. Yeah, but it's all going to be name recognition. Those are the folks that are going to do well. Yeah, yeah, for internal communications, um, there's definitely folks using it. Uh, we've had, and usually our, like our bread and butter is individual makers and creators that want to start a podcast, that have an audience and want to speak to that audience or want to grow that audience. But um, recently we've seen a lot more corporations sign up, a lot bigger companies, Fortune 50 companies uh, that want to use private podcasting to for internal communication. So it's an opportunity for sure. Still, like, it's always difficult to figure out how to actually capitalize on it because, you know, podcasting has technical limitations that don't, doesn't make it ideal for like enterprise grade private security stuff but we're, we're pursuing it. Ad revenue only makes up 25% of our total loan ranger income, thankfully. As long as our sponsors don't go under, we'll still get paid. The higher viewership looks great for next year too. Yeah, that's true. So if you've reached out, if you've built relationships directly with sponsors, that uh, is another opportunity. I, I'm still a little bit nervous about it, Ryan, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you know more than me. Uh, the... the I think it's great. I think, you know, there still will be businesses that are looking to spend money on sponsorships. But I think I, I'm worried because the ripples of this are going to continue to go through the economy. And if you think about mountain biking in particular, you know, Silver Star Mountain right now is closed completely. And this would be the time, you know, coming up here when they would be out preparing all of the downhill tracks and you got to guess that they're doing those calculations in their head of, okay, like if people are still in quarantine in June, is it worth, you know, making the trails or maybe people are in quarantine and they just can't get the workers. Like there's all sorts of reasons, but maybe on the other hand, <laughs> listen to me going all over the place. On the other hand, I mean, I'm, I've been on my bike quite a bit and, um, you know, just going out for rides, social distancing, and maybe there will be just a huge demand in mountain biking stuff in particular. And when the quarantine ends, there will be all this pent up demand, which is good too. Job boards. Um, I think job boards are hard. The there's already a glut of job boards before the crisis hit. And so now you're going to have a problem, which is uh, way more demand because way more people are unemployed than supply. There's just not very many jobs. So I, uh, 
I would be, yeah, I, I probably wouldn't start a job board personally unless you had a really good angle on it or some sort of natural advantage. By the way, Ryan, I need your camera advice because I've got a little bit of grain here, you know? I still don't know how to use this camera. <laughs> I, need, I need you to, like, help me with my, uh, help me figure out my, all my, my settings on this camera here so that, um, you know, I, I don't get all that grain stuff. Hey, Christoph, how's it going? Oh man, you just missed all the best stuff. You're just joining now. There's, I, I can't, you're, you're gonna have to rewind. <laughs> uh, I've just been asking people what, how the downturn is affecting their business and um, how they think it might affect their business when, as the shit continues to hit the fan um, and what businesses are anti-fragile, recession-proof, um, what businesses are seeing increased demand right now. And again, like to me, this, um, this email I got from Gumroad is just crazy. Like the number of people looking to start online courses and sell digital downloads and everything else, um, just tons and tons of interest. Uh, and I'm seeing this across all sorts of platforms. The, the, the tricky part about this is yes, course platforms and online digital sale platforms are all seeing an increase in demand, but it is, but that doesn't mean that the demand for those kinds of products like online courses and digital downloads is necessarily going up at the same rate. And so we're going to have the same problem, which is, uh, the supply of digital downloads and courses and you know all the things an independent creator could sell online are going to go up that's the supply and the demand is you know who knows where it is so when you have more supply that adds other challenges um oh by the way i think my friends at tuple are probably doing really well right now uh for sure they have seen some good business from this because now everyone is thinking about working from home and, uh, you know, companies are trying to figure out how to manage all the software developers they have. So uh, right place, right time for tuple and pair programming apps. Although I noticed that they finally have um, some competition what is it? Former screen hero. Uh, where is it? On TechCrunch. So this it looks like the the one of the founders of Screen Hero has just um, launched a similar tool although not specifically aimed at pair programming, but that might, uh, that might give uh, Tuple some competition, but again, they've got a head start, which is always, <laughs> the best place to be is always to have a head start in the right direction when a crisis hits, but it's hard to know what crisis is gonna hit, and so <laughs> it's, it's hard to tell. Uh, you, you know, you, some things you can't forecast, although I think having multiple um, streams of income is helpful. For myself, um, one way this has looked, it, and unfortunately this is probably the answer, is that over the next five, ten years, you probably want to be building something like an additional source of income that will help provide for you when the shit hits the fan. The, the folks that are getting out there now and are like just trying to, um, you know, trying to build new sources of income now, that's going to be so difficult because, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to ramp that up super quick. 
And so uh, I mentioned earlier, I've been building this online community for bootstrappers called Mega Maker since 2013. And um, this past year, it it's done about $38,000 in revenue in US dollars. And so, um, and Mega Maker is certainly the type of thing that people are signing up for right now as they are looking to, you know, build their business um, and they're looking for community and support in doing that. So being in the water already, having already had this pre-existing momentum um, was helpful for me because now I've got this coming in and, uh, you know, if uh, transistor revenue goes down, uh, I'll have something else I could rely on. And uh, interestingly, actually, uh, even the course sales for uh, this course that I did, uh, back, I think I launched this in 2015. It's not selling as well as Mega Maker right now, but um, it's still selling some copies. So there's no easy answers right now um, for this stuff, except that uh, you're probably not going to be able to ramp something up right away no matter how we respond to this as individuals and as a society, it's going to be incremental changes and it's not going to be easy. And, um, it's probably going to take time. And so, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm actually not marketing anything right now. Um, like I'm, I'm not, I haven't written a newsletter in a while. Um, I'm not promoting any of my stuff, even Transistor. I'm not, I'm trying not to like talk too much, mostly because I don't know what's the right tone right now. Uh, so personally, uh, if you, <laughs> you, to get the answer to this, John, you need to listen to uh, my podcast with John Buddha, uh, build your SAS because he's certainly a, a bit more pessimistic than I am. I, in the right now I am concerned. I am heartbroken for all my friends who run local businesses who felt this first. I'm heartbroken for all of my friends who do consulting and programming and, run online businesses that are going to feel this later in a couple weeks or a month or six weeks. But I'm also hopeful that folks like you and me and everybody else here are going to use this as an opportunity to rethink society a bit and to think about how things could be better. How can we enable that local restaurant to have a better business in the future than they did now. How can we, um, how can we create a meaningful hedge against the continued, uh, accumulation of wealth and power by, you know, uh, mega billionaires and mega corporations. And I'm not, necessarily saying, um, like I've said before, I think Amazon should be broken up. I don't think it should be one company. Um, but I think to the future doesn't me doesn't look like the government just going in and shutting Amazon down. I think, I hope the future looks like, uh, networks of businesses of small businesses figuring out how they can together be more efficient, uh, more convenient, faster shipping, and reasonable, reasonably priced compared to Amazon. I do think the government has a role, and it might be breaking Amazon up. And it might also be saying, Amazon, you can't like um, 
you can't cover the cost of shipping at a loss and put all the other small businesses out of business. Like governments can res could theoretically restrict that kind of behavior. And I would be in support of that. I think this kind of, um, what do we call that? When you go in and you just like, you lower all the prices just to destroy all the competition, which is behavior that us in the tech industry has encouraged and cheered for. I think we got to get rid of that. I think governments need to uh, have some legislation to, uh, yeah, to uh, eliminate predator predatory pricing. So, yeah, and like what Walmart does. There needs to be some sort of control in place for that. Uh, there's two things. There's like a monopoly, which is you control everything. You just keep buying everything until you're the only game in town, which in some ways, I mean, Amazon is so close to that. But um, the, the uh, I think with the right kind of um, limits and legislation, Amazon can continue to be a company, but governments can do some things to uh, give small businesses that don't have the advantage of all of this capital from the public markets and venture capitalists and everything else, we at least need to give them a fighting chance. And part of that will be small businesses banding together and creating these meaningful networks. And part of it will be, um, part of it will be technology companies enabling those kind of networks. And then part of it will be the government actually, you know, restricting certain bad behaviors. We've been going about an hour. Uh, anything else you want to ask me before I go? I, um, I probably should wind this down here, especially since uh, I'm surprised the family hasn't uh, come and walked by here. Yeah, uh, I think that outcome is highly unlikely, but I don't know. I'm not a epidemiolo epidemiologist or a scientist or an expert on vaccines, but everything I've seen is that, uh, yeah. Yeah, and on the other side, it's like the all the wheels fall off. But yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Paul. Oh, wow, we got a lot of Pauls. Yeah, lunchtime. Uh, if you want to be a part of MegaMaker, you just go to megamaker.co and uh, you can apply there. Uh, let's see if I can put it up somewhere. It's very manual to type this stuff in, so. Uh, .co. Uh, you just add yourself to the the email list there and um, if it's the right fit for you you can join it's a it's $299 to join and that's for lifetime access so if that's something you'd like feel free to go there and yeah folks um, stay well stay healthy I love you all I hope you're doing well and um, we're going to get through this. Let's keep having these kinds of conversations and articulating these things so we can figure out a better future. All right? Stay safe. See ya.